So I'm Bruce Calton, the VP of Consulting Services here at Cleggan. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the test data we're seeing in our lab. So I'm first going to talk a little bit about the PFAS regulation globally. I will put some context under what we're testing and why. We're a big fan of, here at Cleggan of, of what's the requirement, what's the output, and what's the best way to get there. Um, there isn't often just one best way. So we work on, you know, in this particular situation, what's the best way to get there? And, and then actually execute it. So um, talking about what the outputs are is kind of a big deal in, in talking about the process to get there. Now we're talking about testing process, which is one of the best ways to get there for this sort of thing for PFAS reportables. Um, I'm going to talk about what we're doing and how how it works. So you get a better idea when we talk about the laboratory test results. You have an idea where they came from originally, and then um, you know what what PFAS for reportable PFAS we're seeing. And, and what percentage of products have reportable PFAS? What's the breakdown of reportable PFAS situations? And then explain the main reportable situations. The, the two most common reportable PFAS are two situations that most people did not even know existed. And I talk about their occurrence and their use and why they're being used and what's the risk of them being restricted. And then again, about a risk-based testing for PFAS and how we test PFAS very effectively and faster and, and more accurately by a mile and uh, much less expensive than trying to do data gathering and you actually get a good result. And then we'll do a little Q&A. So if you have any questions during the presentation, try to submit them at the end. I'll try to get to as many as possible. So uh, this is a brief map of a lot of the restricted materials compliance requirements that apply globally. The ones that have PFAS in them are the blue ones. So there's a lot more PFAS requirements than there was before. Um, a lot of them have historically been around PFOA and some of the longer chain water soluble uh, PFAS carboxylates. Um, these are uh, potential manufacturing ingredients to make the PFAS polymers you use, the fluoroalkyl substance polymers you use, or as a degradation product of the polymers you use. Generally, PFOA and similar you never use intentionally, you use a polymer intentionally. Um, so one of the key major regulatory sections is this. This is the main one. There's also state of Maine, which is a different main. State of Maine, you have to report. Uh, it's mandatory reporting um, basically six months after your extension. So likely around July, you may have some more time there. Um, and you're reporting data on your intentionally added PFAS and their uses. The big one's here in the EU. So there's a consultation between March and September on the reach restriction of fluoroalkyl substances. And it's being March and September. And any derogation, which is exemption, that will exist in the future will only exist if it's submitted here. So if you're using a fluoroalkyl substance, usually a, a fluoropolymer, and there's a reason to use it, and its replacement's not as good, et cetera, you want to make sure it's submitted in this consultation. If the use is justified and submitted in this consultation, it'll likely stick around for the next one to two decades. Otherwise, you're going to lose it and have to redesign your product in the, over the next three years. Right now, the situation stands today, everybody's going to redesign basically all of their products over the next three years, unless some proper derogations, which is a fancy term for exemption, are, submit, are included in this restriction. So the restriction is today will basically involve the redesign of virtually all products and almost 100% of electronics due to some very common PFAS usages. So, the timeline is to get that submission between March and September. And to do that, you have to know what your uses are. So you really want to do your main reporting structure so you know early, like now, what your, your portal PFAS are. So A, you can report to main, but more importantly, actually, to make sure your uses are covered under the EU. So if your uses get submitted as part of consultation, which includes this is what it we're using it for, and this is the justification. So you have to do all this justification work. Or somebody does, you have to ensure somebody's done it properly. What we've seen from the derogations in the past, and I'll show some examples, is often they're very limited to whatever company submitting them has asked for. It's their particular situation, and it doesn't necessarily cover everyone else. And there's a lot of examples of that in the PFAS restrictions for PFOA and similar, where the derogations, which, so in a regulations of derogation, in a directive like ROHS, it's an exemption. Um, the derogations, exemptions, um, for PFOA and similar up until now are because companies have asked for them, but they're often too narrow. They only apply to their particular situation and are not broadly. Some of the medical ones are a little more broad, but a lot of the others are too narrow. So there's that window. What you need it for and why you need it needs to get into this window. So you need to know what your portal PFAS are for me, for here. You're going to have to report federally in about a year, and you have to report in Canada later this year. 
even if for all the same reason. Basically the same data, what you're intentionally added, PFAS, which are almost exclusively floral polymers. Um, so here's an example of what a derogation is. So this is the reach restriction. It's already on the books, not a proposal. So the previous page, this is a proposed one. There's a consultation for it. This is one that currently exists in the reach. And it's for the longer versions of PFOA, the long chain before alkyl carboxylates, also called the long chain before carboxylic acids, tomato, tomato, same thing, PFAC, PFCA, same thing. PFOA is eight carbons long, O, octa. This is for N, nona, D, deca, the longer ones, N, nine, 10. And on the right side, it has what's called derogations. Derogations are, in a directive, we call, we call it an exemption normally. It's a fancy word of saying exemption, which is kind of a fancy way to say, you know, reasons you don't have to do things. Um, so when it says, you know, 4th of July, 2025 for invasive and implantable medical devices, that's a derogation. That exists because somebody asked for it, usually the medical industry. To get these, they have to be asked for in the consultation and justified. If you ask for it, then you likely get them. And, and the timeframes in the PFAS restriction means you're going to get it for another decade or two decades or longer if you ask for it and justify it. But if you don't, you're going to have to redesign the product. Slight cost difference. So there's a huge, huge cost benefit of getting this squared away properly now. Okay, so what we do for P, when we're doing PFAS testing, so I'm going to talk about what we're seeing PFAS. This is two pieces. The main one for all this reporting, it's just in the first section. It's a screening using the WDXRF. A lot of people go, hey, do you have a list of CAFS numbers for PFAS? No, why do you care? People are like, well, I need to know more restricted PFAS. No, no, it's literally what you're using It's a polymer. It doesn't, it will not often have a CAFS number. It's too complicated. It's just whether or not the fluorine is over 50 ppm. No fluorine, no perfluoroalkyl substance, no PFAS. It's that easy. So, and the, there was a wall, there's parts for building PFOA. PFOA only exists inside a fluoropolymer well over 10,000 ppm. Uh, PFOA is a trace manufacturing aid or degradation product, depending on the situation, to a PFAS polymer. It's so low concentration, it's only detectable at 25 parts per billion in PFASs that are in the, you know, mostly in the 100,000 ppm fluorine range. So much, much higher. So we actually use the WDXRF to find the fluorine. So a lot of people for RHS use the ED, energy dispersive XRF, which like the handheld. And they're very good, they're very fast, and we love them. We have 15 of them in that family, at least. Um, they're superb for, for a lot of the higher elements. However, they have trouble with higher periodic table. One of the many reasons is oxygen error. Um, the, the fluorine, so far, the, the periodic table, the air will attenuate the XRF signal. Oxygen and argon and nitrogen will all take away a lot of the signal. So um, you need a WDXRF, which is much more power, but also is a vacuum. And, and can test fluorine directly. So it's very, very good. It's even better in a lot of ways than combustion bomb because we can tell there's the coatings and internal materials. Um, so we can see fluoro coatings really, really well. We also use an FTIR in parallel. So the FTIR won't tell us if there's low levels of PFAS in there. They will tell us, you know, if it's a PTFE itself. What we use it for is the, the WDX draft will tell us what the fluorine concentration is, whether it's about 50 ppm. And the FTIR will tell us what plastic gets in and allows us to identify really what cast number we're dealing with and what's uses. So a much better idea of one will tell us, you know, is there a PFAS here? The other one helps us combine the data and says, this is why, what it's in. And then we can do an engineering assessment of what it is and why it's there. Because all of these reporting, you have to actually have put your use in, big part. So it's really a two piece item. And if you want to protect your uses for Europe, you need to know your uses. So we do them in parallel. Um, we're, ba we're a test laboratory, but basically a factory. We're a very high volume location. So it's huge advantages in time and cost here. Um, now, if a PFAS is present and we're worried about PFOA and similar, which are restricted in Europe and to a lesser extent under Prop 65 and soon Canada, we have to use a, a liquid chromatograph, tandem mass spec, and that's for the 25 parts per billion. But we only have to use that in materials that have high concentrations of fluorine. No PFAS, no... Um, there's no degradation product or trace contaminant of the PFAS. PFOA doesn't exist by itself. It's a water soluble salt. It's used, when it's used, it's used as surfactant for the manufacturing process of PTFE or similar. It controls the size of the PTFE powder, which is actually a big deal. Um, it, there are many other things that can do the same job, so you don't have to use it. It can also be degradation product from 
side chain fluoroacrylic. So if you have a, a raincoat, it's actually not PTFE powder on it. PTFE powder is normally like your frying pan is added to the frying pan and then heated up to 600 degrees Celsius and then melts and fuses. You're not going to heat up your raincoat to 600 degrees Celsius. It would be, it'll be smaller and and burnt um, afterwards. So what they do instead is it's a side chain acrylic, which I've seen on other uh, webinars. Basically, you have an acrylic, almost like a paint or a similar material as as polymethyl methacrylate, your contact lenses, and then every so often down the polymer, it's got these PFAS chain sticking out on an ester, a little oxygen bond. And that's the, the, the fluoro. Um, that oxygen bond is weak, it can break, and you often, because the oxygen around it, these broken pieces react with air and the similar and create carboxylates, which is PFOA. And that's a degradation product. But again, it only exists in the fluoropolymer. So PFOA only exists inside a fluoropolymer. So if we found it, then we know where to look for PFOAs. If we're just looking for reporting, which is what I'm talking about today, we'll have another webinar at some point in time. We'll talk about all the wonderful places we find PFOA and longer but I'm gonna go back and it's really either as an additive to make PTFE to control the powder or as a degradation product from a, uh, either a side chain, well, basically only side chain uh, polymer, either an acrylic polymer side chain or a perfluoro oxy one, which should come up a bit later. They're all side chain polymers. Basically you have a main polymer and you have these PFAS is sticking off the side of the polymer, it's called the side chain. It's these pieces that stick off like little PFAS hair that snap off and become PFOA. And that's a degradation product. Again, it's only there if a floral polymer is there. So I'm really going to talk about this one today, uh, where we're seeing the intentionally added PFAS, which is where A, the reportables are, and B, where your PFO risks can be. And you were, we're looking at it for main reporting. The Canadian Canada is going to have a Section 71 survey later this year on it. You'll see that um, probably next month or so. Um, the, the final rule for Tosca PFAS reporting likely to be published, which means you'll likely have to report next year. Um, there's also the European PFAS restriction consultation I just talked about, which is critical. You need to get your, your use and make sure they're covered uh, between March and September. And we use it for pre-screening for, for restricted PFOA risk and similar. But I'm going to talk about this one today. And so again, there's just two different groupings. Uh, there's ones that you worry about at a cast level, and that's the non-polymers, the water-soluble PFAS. And that's PFOA and similar. They're unintentional additives or degradation products. The supplier, unless they're a plastics primary supplier, will know nothing. And even some of the plastics primary suppliers do have trouble with them as, as a degradation products, which we've definitely seen. These aren't normally supplier reported. Um, unless they're primary, so if they're Solvay or Dakin or 3M, they normally know. But anybody beyond that, don't bother. They won't, they won't know better. Um, and then what we're talking about today is the intentionally added polymer. So the PFOA is never added to your product. It's a it's a manufacturing aid that can be used, but doesn't have to be to make PTFE, or it's a degradation product of the fluoroacrylic polymer you're using. Um, what you're using is the one at the bottom, polymer PFAS. And they don't, in Europe, they don't even have EC numbers or chemical numbers. Um, they can be quite complicated. So that's why the top right are governed in parts per billion of specific cast numbers. The bottoms are governed by PPM fluorine. Not like worry about cast numbers. Uh, I love when I get a, love in quotations, I get a list of all these cast numbers and do you have this in your product? I'm a pretty fair chemist and it's, it's not usable. It really should be, are you compliant with this regulation or something specific? Um, and cast numbers. So the PFOA in the bottom the right, by the way, doesn't exist in PFOA. It, it exists as PFOA minus, potentially as a, as, a, as a contaminant in your product. But in the outside world, there's reason there's so many cast numbers where it's actually controlled as a cast, because what you can buy in a jar is where the cast number comes from, not from the dissolved version in your product. It's potassium PFOA, so K is potassium, just one of those things. It's like before alkyl substance. Fluoro is fluorine, makes sense. Alkyl is carbon, what? Yeah, I know. Alkanes, alkyl, carbon. A is carbon. Uh, alkyl. Sometimes in a lot, actually, it's funny if you're doing diagrams, uh, carbon chains are often R just to be a nuisance. I'm a chemist. I, I did organic chemistry a lot. And um, yeah, even now I do tons of, of course, obviously tons and tons of chemistry. There's more than one way to name almost every substance, which is a bit of a pain. Um, but normally you'll see initially it's potassium, PFOA. It's the same thing with that hexavalent chromium, actually, for ROHS. You don't see it as hexavalent chromium. You see it as a chromate ion from dissolved potassium dichromate. 
um, again, it's it's the water soluble section. So this is um, quite different. It's potassium PFOA is normally, but it could be sodium PFOA, it could be ammonium PFOA, APFO. It's also called APFO, ammonium PFOA, APFO um, is the ammonium version. That's all the zillion cash numbers, but that's not in your product. So like when we test for PFOA, we're not testing for potassium PFOA, we're testing for PFOA minus, which is, is what the, the piece will be in your product. That's my cast number, and they're never intentionally added. PFBS is the one minor, minor exception I'll talk about later. It's a short chain uh, sulfonate. Um, but what's really added is the polymers down below. That's what's added to your product, not the water soluble salt. The water soluble salt is not going to be there at the end of the day. So we're talking about this part. So, and again, these intentionally added PFAS are controlled by fluorine concentration, not by cast number. That's the way they're regulated. So 50 ppm in Europe, 100 in Maine. And believe it or not, it's actually a little bit different between the two. That actually does make a difference in a lot of situations. Um, so we, of course, detect fluorine, we have WDX or F, and then we use the parallel, use the FTIR to help with what is actually going on here. What plastic is it in, which helps us tell us. So it's pure PTFE, it's pretty easy. Um, but it also can be ECTFE, it can be similar ones. But it also is an additive. It's an additive in ABS. Why is it in the ABS? Well, there's a reason for it. And, and the FTR helps us identify the fact it's ABS that it's in. So when we tested between February and March of this year, and we test the product. So where's my phone? This is a product. Um, there's many, many parts in it. So when we test a product like this, about on average, about 3% of parts we test have PFASs. But when it comes down to this product, 90% of the products we test have at least one PFAS component in there. Of a complex electronics, it's 100%. All complex electronics we've tested of any complexity um, have had a PFAS in. They all do. And all of these are currently on the block to be restricted um, under the new reach restriction, which would involve, if it goes through as is, without you submitting in those derogations, that consultation, um, redesigning every electronic product you make over the next three years. Just tell you. There's a good reason why to get this done now. Very, very motivational to get that done now. Okay, so when we look at the positives we got, the individual parts, and we break it down to 100%, probably a bit pie chart would have been better here, actually, in retrospect, because I sit here and look at this bar chart and think a pie chart would have be better. I'll do a pie chart, pie chart next time. Um, what are our main ones? And the two biggest ones, uh, anti-drip and wire coating. Everybody's like, well, I don't have PTFE wires. No, no, not PTFE wire. That's the fifth one. This is an anti-friction coating inside your wires. Those are the two most common. You're like, what? What's an anti-drip? Is it like just related to water? I don't do anything related to water. It's related to flame retardancy. I'm like, what? I'll explain. So, um, release agent. That's a small one, and it's not really in chron it's kind of in chronological order, not size order of, of a lot of our testing. Release agent. This is a mold release agent. This is, imagine you make muffins, and if you just put the batter in the muffin tin and don't put, a, and, and don't put anything down, if you cook it, you're going to be chipping the muffin uh, out of it because it's stuck to it. Well, unless it's a Teflon muffin tin, then maybe not. <laughs> But uh, so otherwise, you normally put like a paper cup in there, or you put butter in there, or you put some other non-stick coating. Butter, by the way, is a non-stick coating. Um, it's quite effective one. That is a mold release agent. Butter, you put in your muffin tin, is a mold release agent. The most, one of the most common ones is a fluoropolymer spray. It's usually fluorosilicone, but it could be others. Uh, Dye Free is one of the many name, name brands. It's very, very good at it. Um, and it's quite useful. I mean, this is a pretty benign, PTFE itself is, is harmless, and this is a silicone, usually, can be other things. Um, so you take the mold, and you put your plastic in it, especially one that's being molded, polyurethane foam being one of the most interesting, in the mold, because polyurethane foam does not exist in those shapes to start with. It put, it's put in a mold, and then it, it's, it's heated up, and it bubbles, and it creates that, that open cell foam. So like the, the cushion you're sitting on right now is a polyurethane foam. Uh, it's open cell, so when you sit on it, it goes whoosh, the air whooshes out. Um, it, like the muffin, would stick to the mold. So they usually spray it, and normally with a floral. And you actually ask your mold, they're like, the watch bring up the aerosol can, you mean this guy? And they spray it, which is perfectly fine. Right now, it is not regulated. Polyurethane foam in particular, so polycarbonate they can use, and polycarbonate is quite solid. Polyurethane foam is quite porous, so it actually sucks up a lot of the release agent. It makes it quite measurable. 
So we see almost all polyurethane foam is packaging or inside the, uh, like the LCD screen is, it's a little foam backing to it. That, we see it all the time. Um, supplier data won't identify this, by the way. We're relying on supplier data for PFAS. What? I want to say brave, naive, naive view. <laughs> um, it doesn't really work in the situation. And with the time frame and seriousness, I wouldn't get it wrong. And it, it's more expensive. Anywho. Um, so mold release agent. To enable the release of plastics from a metal mold, that's what it's used for. It's basically an aerosol spray usually. Or it can, it can be a liquid, like putting on butter in your muffin tin, it can be like that. Um, it, and it's really much higher concentration of porous materials such as polyurethane. Polyethylene foam, which is like your pool noodle, um, is, is it's closed cell. So uh, if you ever take your pool noodle foam, which is closed cell, by the way, and you try to blow in it, you're going to make your face purple. Um, I've done that to show you an example. Um, it's closed cell. There's no air passage. And so it doesn't suck up the release agent nearly as much. Polyurethane foam, like what your, your bottom is sitting on right now, is quite porous. It's open cell. Uh, if you put your mouth down on your, your chair and blew, you could actually blow through it. Um, and I'm not going to do that. Um, and that's porous and it sucks up a ton of mold release agent. They both use it, but you see a lot more in the polyurethane because of it. Now, the bright side of Maine, it's totally not reportable. It is not intentionally added. You're saying, well, I'm using it on purpose in the manufacturing process. Yes, but there's no function in the end product. Therefore, not intentionally added. Ask that about a function of the end product. Uh, is it PFOA risk? So, okay, what about current European restrictions on PFOA? The amount of mold release is so low concentration of any. So, if it was solid PTFE, which it's not, which is 100% of PTFE and basically, you know, 40% fluorine or so, the amount of PFOA in this might be a couple hundred parts per billion. So, just trace contaminant. If you're down, instead of being 400,000 ppm, you're the couple hundred ppm in the mold release agent, there just won't be enough PFOA. It's not our issue. Um, now, for the reach proposed restriction, there is no derogation for it. Therefore, it is banned in 2027. You can't have this stuck to your product um, by roughly 20, at earliest be August 2027. That time frame is when it's going to kick in. So unless this gets submitted in the consultation and for good justification, all your mold releases and for everything will have to be redone. And it's not fun. By the way, it's a great question this morning. There is an extremely common uh, fluoro use that I'm not talking about here because it isn't related because we don't find it in your product, but it's used for most of your products. So when you, you machine a piece of metal and it's often gets some mineral oil on it, it's part of the machining process, you then degrease it, the degreasing process. And, and you really need to degrease it really well if it's in medical or you're electroplating it. Because if you don't degrease it, it has mineral oil on it, it won't plate for beans. Uh, when you electroplate, you know, it won't work. So you need to grease it really well. And the best degreaser is uh, floral ethers, usually made by 3M, but many other companies, um, and they do the degreasing. So wherever it's manufactured, it needs to be allowed there to do the degreasing. Otherwise, you're going to see a sudden change in the quality of your products if it goes away. However, none of it's residual metal. Metal has absolutely no porous. Um, and then fluoropolymers are also incredibly, and fluoro ethers are incredibly low. Uh, friction and they just don't sit around. So you won't find any in your product, but it's used all the time to make your product. So it doesn't come up here because we won't see in your test data because the floral ether is used to degrease the mineral oil on your electroplated part won't appear in our testing because it won't be there by then. But it's a very common usage. Then the anti-drip though, uh, the mold release, sorry, the mold release we do see because it's sucked up in the cushion. And I'm pretty sure I got a picture I didn't fix. I'm going to fix the third version that's coming up. Um, so the biggest one's anti-drip. You ever say, oh yeah, anti-drip additives. I know what those are. Nope, it's uh, it's not related really to water flow. It's related really to flame retardancy. So if anybody here does uh, a larger group of safety and does um, electrical safety, a there's a lot of flame retardancy requirements in UL94 being one of them, but there's many other standards. Uh, one of the big parts of it, when the plastic burns with the highest flame retardancy ratings, it's not only not allowed to burn, it's not allowed to drip hot plastic on you. That's a big deal. So if this fellow is burning, but kind of just charred a bit, but then dropped hot plastic on it, dropping hot plastic on me would be a problem. So they're not allowed to drip. And unfortunately, polycarbonate and ABS and some other plastics, they when they burn, they drip. So to avoid that, they add about a half a percent of PTFE to it. It's pretty common. That's and that's what we see more than anything else, especially in outer housings like this guy. I, not to say this part. I haven't tested this part. I'm kind of using it right now. I don't really want to destroy it today. Um, 
the about half a percent PTFE. And a tiny bit of PFBS, which is a short chain sulfonate. It is a salt. It is one of the extremely rare cases that a perfluoro substance is used as a salt. Now, it's an additive to go with the PTFE. It doesn't exist without the PTFE always being there. So it's not part of the PTFE, but it only exists in a situation where PTFE exists. It is a reach SVHC, but it's so low concentration, it's not normally reported. It'll be sub 100 ppm, not the SVHC reportable limit. Um, we see it in primary and plastics housings, um, if an ABS and polycarbonate, polycarbonate ABS blend, but we see it all the time. As I said, it's the number one candle by a mile. Almost 50% of all PFAS positives we see are anti-drip agents in housings in electronics. Whee. Um, so its use is to prevent dripping of plastic during burning. It's quite reportable in Maine because it has a use. It's an anti-drip agent. Um, it's pretty low risk for PFOA. So it, it is PTFE powder added to it. PTFE powder can use PFOA to, to control powder size. But the concentration is so low at half a percent that uh, you know a couple hundred P, P parts per billion PFOA that would be in 100% PTFE at 0.5%, 20 times lower is pretty low risk of being 25 parts per billion. So we're not expecting to see PFOA above the reporting limit, 25 parts per billion. It could be there, but well below detection level. Um, is it, would it be restricted underneath the new PFAS restriction? Restriction? Yep, there's no derogation for it. People have to ask for it. Oil and gas is a broad one for everything, but otherwise, no derogation, no exemption for it. So if this goes through as is, over the next three years, if you're making electronics, you redesign it, unless people submit why this is needed, and continued for it and make sure your application isn't just for you know what a lot of them are submitted for we needed to be okay for abs and you know gas monitors well that's their application of yours so you want to make sure you're in there it's number one we see it all the time um literally we're doing projects for for uh government authorities actually on flame retards and what we do see is ptfe come in as the anti-drip in the flame retarded uh, plastic we're doing the testing on them for the national authority yes we do testing for national authorities and stuff too lots of good stuff um wire pulling lubricant and this is a weird one now it's not necessarily it can be a gel lubricant it's usually an aerosol um so what happens is it, it it's a wider group so it's the pull wires through something else it could be through a cable jacket it could be through the conduit um it creates flexibility. So one of the problems on a multi-conductor strand inside is that they have friction on each other. So a couple of things, if you're trying to pull it through, which historically they've used talc, and talc often is asbestos, and that's why it's frowned upon. Um, but if they floral coat it, it's easy to pull through the outer jacket. But even if you don't have to pull through it, and you're just extruding over it, um, the internal wires, if would have a lot of friction on each other and grip and make them less flexible, but also wear down quicker as they rub, quicker as they rub they spray it with a either a floral gel or a floral aerosol and that enables to be either pulled through a cable or lowers their friction well it does both and lowers their friction increases the durability of flexible cables they don't grip um and we see it all the time now when we, we see it inside a cable every single one of those those, those lines have it and this isn't ptfe wire that's a different one this is literally a floral coating on polyethylene or pvc or whatever wire it is to make it uh, more flexible, low, lower the friction. It's a, it's a reduced friction. Um, so our data never identifies this. It's, a, it's an anti-friction coating inside. It's one of many wonderful additives. Somebody's making the wire, you know, it's wow, we can make a wire a lot faster and a lot easier. We just spray it with this aerosol as we do it, which is what's happening. Have you ever wanted your wire supplier to be cheaper? Yeah, the easiest way to be cheaper is you spray the wires with the floral coating, so it's much easier to handle. So we see it all the time. Um, this isn't PTFUR, this is literally like an aerosol spray, usually. It can be a gel. So if you're doing it through a conduit, it's often a gel, but it's usually a spray from where we see it. Uh, so it's a low concentration on the surface, a couple hundred ppm, polyfluoro, so we can see the fluorine. Um, very, very common. Of course, we, the numbers are increased for the fact we do see it. Every single wire has it. So we're doing counts. It's like six wires, six positives. Um, same thing with the, uh, the anti-drip. When the housing material has it, all the different housing pieces have it. Not a shock. So it, you either enable, since so you see the pull wires in, into a multi-strand cable or a conduit, or it improves the flexibility and durability by reducing internal friction. And on the right is the picture that should be there. That's polyurethane. There should be a cable. Imagine a multi-strand cable picture right here being flexible. That's what should be there. And I'm going to fix that in the final version. Just imagination time. 
Um, main reporting. So main it has use, it's reportable. It's creating flexibility. So it, theoretically, if it's just to pull it through the cable, it, it's only for manufacturing, but it also gives it flexibility and durability. So it has a use. Um, it's low it's it's so low concentration that any residual PFOA is below detection. Um, but it is a high risk for the proposed PFAS restriction because nobody's asked for a derogation for it. Um, and that'll affect virtually every I would say every cable, maybe 25% of all cables out there. It's really common. Somebody says, hey, I want a cheaper cable. You know, easier way to make it, especially when you have custom cables, you spray it with a fluoro aerosol. By the way, I'm probably talking a bit quickly and I'm trying not to use as much chemistry as normal. Um, I like chemistry, not everybody does. It hasn't yet really improved uh, get my odds of getting invited for over for dinner, uh, for sure. Um, but, ah, uh, yeah, right. And mold release agents, I talked about this. This is the other thing I have to fix. I realized this morning, I had this twice. It's very exciting. You get to see that picture for the third time. That uh, repetition's good, I'm told. PTFE part. Now we do see parts that are actually PTFE. And, and most PTFE parts, which this is not, um, what ends up happening is they're almost always, solid PTFE is almost always PTFE powder that's put into a mold, then heated up and it fuses. And I say, hey, they might use a floral mold release. We won't see it. If this part is PTFE, there's more fluorine than you can imagine. This thing. Um, that one, by the way, is obviously not. It's probably polycarbonate, ABS blend. Um, so you take powder, you put it in a mold, and then you heat it up to 600 degrees Celsius. It fuses, and there you have the part, the salt piece. And it could be the center of a coax. So it's inside the, you look at the little white thing inside a coax cable. It's there for dielectric reasons. It has great dielectric capabilities. It's used in medical devices for incredibly good reasons. One, it's water and chemical resistant. So the real claim to flame of all the PFAS, is poor alkyl substances, is the carbon fluoride bond has no surface charge. So metals, by the way, have huge surface charge, and that's why if you put two metals next to each other, they have huge grip. Um, huge friction. That's when your brake pad runs out and you go metal on metal and get one hell of an interesting sound. Um, there are, those are high friction. These are really low friction. But also having no surface charge, not only no friction, because without surface charge, there, there's no grip. Um, they water, they're very repellent to water. So water is, you know, oxygen, big molecule, sort of bigger molecule, two little tiny little hydrogens. The oxygen pulls the electrons off the hydrogen, so it has all the electrons, which makes it very negative. So you have a negative end, and the two little tiny hydrogens have lost their electrons. They become very, very positive. So it's very, very pulp, which is the whole, you know, why water is so useful. Um, the water won't react with with a perfluoroalkyl substance. It has no charge. This highly charged polar molecule has no interest in it. It's actually so low charged, even oils have no interest in it. So it's extremely water resistant, it's extremely chemical resistant. So if you take silicone, which is a potential replacement for PFAS, it is A, not as water resistant, but more importantly, it is definitely not chemically resistant. Silicone sucks up oil like it smells and stains. So if you have a, like a, a fluoropolymer waterproof jacket, it'll be water resistant and stain resistant. If it's silicone, it's just gonna be water resistant and guaranteed you're gonna have body odor smell in it pretty quickly because it'll suck up your oils. So if you have any cooking utensils and stuff like that, use a lot and smell the silicone they've sucked up all the smells because they suck up the oils. Um, PTFE doesn't do that. And it's also got incredibly good biocompatibility. It doesn't react with anything. That's it's one of its major claim to fame. It's also fantastic at high temperature, where it's for reasons why it's used in a lot of different things. So sometimes you'll also have you know, PTFE bearings or PTFE components, the low friction or the, the water resistance or chemical resistance is really handy. Where we see it most in electronics, solid PTFE, is the guy on the far right side, bottom right, that transformer. Like I have a lot of transformers. It's just a polyester uh, tape around a copper winding and you know a PBT or some other simple plastic middle. Yes. Look really closely on the board though. You will notice that often you have these wires coming off it and they're transparent tubes over top. That's PTFE. PTFE is a higher temperature um, capability in PVC. So we often see them coming out of transformers. Really common usage. It's actually a little, little unknown, unloved. Uh, tubes, nobody knows what they really are. They're often PTFE. They can be PVC, but PVC is not as temperature resistant. Supply data will often uh, identify these, not necessarily on the transformer, um, but many other things. I mean, this is, you know, you're using 100% you know, PTFE for something. And for medical device, it makes a lot of sense. You want it to be, you know, 
really biocompatible, which means it doesn't react with human beings. You don't want the stick. If somebody's running an endoscope up your uh, some artery or some you know catheter or into something important, you probably don't want it to stick, and you don't want it to react uh, with your blood or fat or oils or blood. That would be a bad idea. Um, starts reacting and, and 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 sticking to you. Last thing you want is the, the you know the catheter or pieces, especially when you're deep inside and you start sticking to all the pieces of you. That would be awkward. PTFP doesn't do that. It's incredibly useful. It also, if done properly, can be made flexible, especially if you're radiating. So solid PTFE has very diverse applications. We don't see it as often um, because it's very very specific. When we're doing medical devices, we see it more. Um, we're seeing things in the chemical industry. We see it more. We see the floral, now this isn't the floral elastomers like Viton. The floral rubbers are, I'll talk about later. We do see those very application specific. We do see them often enough. So the device, diverse use, low friction, they're water and chemical resistant. They have great biocompatibility from all plastics. I think they basically have the lowest um, surface charge, which makes them generally the best at every at all these things. And they have uh, interesting dielectric properties why they're used in coax tubes. Uh, main, they're obviously used on purpose. The reportable uses are quite diverse. They are a PFOA risk because you know we're dealing with 100% PTFE. It can have a couple hundred uh, parts per billion residual PFOA for the manufacturing process. It's what it's used as a surfactant to control the powder size. However, it doesn't have to be. There's lots of other options. Now that industry, basically government said, hey, we don't want PFOA. The companies are like, all right, we can do that. And we don't want any residual. Oh, per billion, really? Okay, we'll just scrub it out. And so a lot of the new ones like PF hex, which is six, and A and S, which are used, our replacements are often just scrubbed out. It's like, well, if you don't want it in it, we'll just scrub it out. The, the manufacturing process to make PTFE is, is spectacular because TFE, the building block of PTFE, reacts to oxygen and detonates in a fiery way. So the entire process is quite intricate to begin with. So adding a little more like scrubbing isn't the end of the world. Um, it's, it's chance of being uh, restricted. It depends. It's all use specific. Some medical use like catheters and tubing and implantables have proposed derogations, um, but most other general uses, coax, a lot of the, the other medical device uses, um, and so on and so forth, low friction bearings, they, are, they don't have any derogations, i.e. exemptions um, being proposed. So if you're using PTFE parts and it's important, you want to make sure that use and your use for your part, especially PTFE, may not be the same as other people. You want to make sure that there might be some other people, but don't. I've been around so many situations. Well, there's so many other companies with it. They'll submit it. Nobody does. And then nobody has it anymore. The medical industry is a little better at getting together and submitting in common. Everybody else is lousy at it. And that's an understatement. So don't expect somebody else to do it for you. And if they do, it's probably not going to extend you half the time. Uh, PTFU wire. Um, so this is actually where the insulation jacket is PTFU. So not the PTFE coating for friction, it's actually PTFU wire. Um, and and PDF wire has a big advantages in high temperature resistance, so we're more likely to see it or silicone in a, in a stove or something similar. It's got much better water or chemical resistance. It's got different dielectric properties. Generally, the supplier data will identify it because they're using PTFE. Uh, it's on purpose. It's a little more expensive than PBF, PVC, PBS, PVC. Um, so it, it, it's generally a little easier to get more to get data on. Um, we do see it in more diverse applications. I wouldn't. It, we do see it as wire and hookup wire situations where we wouldn't necessarily expect, uh, expect it. It doesn't necessarily need PTFE, but they chose it, especially if they moved away from PVC. Very diverse wire applications, especially in the high temperature. We see it for many different things. A main, it's, it's used on purpose. You'd have to report it. Um, it is a high risk of PFOA because it, it's made from PTFE. And it's, the outer jacket's 100% PTFE, basically. Um, and the proposed reach restriction doesn't have PFAS restriction doesn't have any derogations for wire. So all of this would be um, banned unless the uses are submitted and justified. And considering that PTFE is absolutely inert, the thing that's dangerous in it is the potential PFOA contaminant, which doesn't even have to be there. And PFOA is only dangerous in high concentrations um, because as a surfactant, it reacts to your kidney, your protein surfactant in your kidneys and can affect kidney function. But so does the surfactant in your laundry detergent. Your laundry detergent is like a million times higher concentration or 10 million times higher concentration. So it's really not that big a deal. Um, it is a forever chemical. However, it's replacing silicone. So if this was PTFE here on the right and this one was silicone, PTFE silicone, the silicone one, so the PTFE one might, might have 100 parts per billion PFOA. 
band count. The silicone is most likely going to have 500 parts per million, not billion, million D4, D5, or D6, which are known um, and reach SVHC for other chemicals. So it will be over 5,000 times higher concentration of a forever chemical in the silicone. And, and for sure, it'll always have it at some level compared to the, the PTFE. So again, you have to make the justification. And one of those, like the, the other like the replacements are performance wise awful and way more forever chemicals. I think him nailing home is like, this one's much safer. Don't get away from the safe ones. Um, floral astomers we do see. This is often called Viton. Uh, Vi Viton is a catch-all brand name for a soup, often called FKM. It's floral rubbers. The main one is a copolymer slash polymer of vinylene fluoride. VDF is the building block of PVDF. And, and hexafluoropropylene. Um, it's a rubber. Kind of feels a bit like silicone, but it's not. It's definitely slippier. And it's excellent water and chemical resistance, which silicone does not. Um, the, chem the chemical resistance is the main reason it's used as a gasket over nitrile rubber, SBR rubber. Nitrile rubber and SBR rubber are often used in a number of water applications. But once you start seeing real chemicals, uh, petroleum and such, they just can't handle it and you have to use Python. One of the reasons why the oil and gas industry has blanket derogations for these types of materials in the reach restriction. And it's excellent temperature resistance. Capital T in this case, a bit odd. And we also see it quite a bit in uh, prolonged human contact. So one of the other ways to make a band is you make it silicone, but silicone will suck up your oils and you may actually react to whatever you get into it. And if you ever get something on your body which is irritating, and if it's oil-based or oil-soluble, it gets sucked up in a silicone band. So Viton doesn't have that problem. It's completely inert and quite chemical and water resistant. A little more expensive than silicone, but, but uh, pretty spectacular. Now, supplier data will often identify the FGAM. However, we do find when we try to buy Viton, uh, which is the brand name for this. The suppliers are a bit dicey about it. Um, that's actually Viton or not. Generally, we, when we try to buy Viton, 50% of the Viton we end up buying ends up not being Viton. Ends up being some other rubber, like silicone. It's quite easy to tell silicone apart from Viton. One's got silicon, one's got fluorine. Quite different in our testing. Um, so they're often used for chemical, uh, the, the floral elastomers, which are normally the Viton type family. Is chemical and temperature resistant seals we see all the time. They often have quite an interesting color to them. Orange is probably the most common, but it doesn't have to be. That's usually the iron they add to it. Um, human contacting rubber, we do see it because it's probably one of the most human contacting. For rubbers, it's probably the most human compatible. Uh, nitrile rubber will often have a, a vulcanizer, uh, which is an endocrine disruptor. Um, silicone has forever chemicals in it. Uh, and, and generally sucks up the oils that it's exposed to and then re-exposes you. By the way, one of the hilarious things, you know the um, like the Live Strong type silicone uh, bands people wore and all those different colored ones? Um, and a lot of people in our industry use them for chemical exposure testing, usually smokers. It's one of the easiest ways to identify the chemicals that smokers are exposed to every day is their smoking hand, you have one of those silicone bands in it and it sucks up all the chemicals they're smoking at least their relative concentration. And by monitoring that, you get an idea of like their live, live strong band. You take the silicone and we, we run it through a GCMS or LC or an LC and you can measure the pHs or whatever else from the burning cigarette. And that tells you what their exposure rates are because that silicone sucks up everything. Silicone bands are tremendous. When we work with companies who make silicone bands and, and different silicone pieces, it's a bit tricky sometimes because they often pick up chemicals in the ventilation system for the manufacturing facility because they suck up anything oil related. Um, Viton does not do that. So main reporting, it's reportable. You're using it on purpose as the gasket or the watch band. Um, PFOA, it's, it's, it's relatively high risk of PFOA. PFOA isn't used for Viton nearly as much as for PTFE, but it could be in the longer chain versions. Um, and it's you know pure Viton. So the, the chance of a trace contaminant being at a measurable level is real. And there's no derogations whatsoever for this material, except for oil and gas. Oil and gas have a blanket one for the next couple of decades, it makes sense. This is, people are hate pipelines because they could leak. This is the, if you take away the Viton, they're going to leak. So there's a good reason to keep that one. If you want, if you, uh, the pipelines worry about them leaking, don't get rid of Viton. Don't, because the other chemicals aren't so hot about, you know, survival. They don't have the temperature resistance, the chemical resistance, all the good things in life. Um, coatings on silicone. This is a relatively unknown one. We've known about this for a while and, and with our testing, we'll be able to see it quite a bit. So it's often a protective coating on silicone. 
Uh, you know, remember the remote controls growing up and you use it so much that eventually the numbers are wear away and you have to remember where the up and down buttons are and which one is volume, which one is channel. Um, that's because the, the silicone that rubs off and the silicone also is very much affected by oils. A lot of the new ones are all floral coated and that gives the writing a lot more resistance um, to, to repeat usage. Or you could have a silicone band or watch or some other, usually it, it's, it's arm related, um, but a silicone wearable. At some point, they often put a floral coating on the surface um, to help uh, protect it from stains and smells and so on and so forth. So we see this light coating on silicone, silicone often enough. Um, so water data normally doesn't identify it. The main, the main manufacturer who makes it likely will know because it'll be part of the process. It doesn't accidentally get a, a floral coating on the silicone. It's there for a reason. It takes cost time and money to do it. So they'll know. Um, but once you get beyond the keypad manufacturer and you get it from you know the entire assembly they won't know so if you're you know if you're buying it from the person molding the the wearable or the silicone pad sure they'll know but anybody at the next stage won't so we see it uh, uses are chemical and stain resistant silicone uh we see it on keypads all the time probably the most common wearables often silicone wearables will have it or silicone you know any kind of wearables so like airbud earbud type things are silicone based, um, wristbands, so on and so forth, watches. Uh, prolonged lifetime on the writing of the silicone. So it, so the keypads repeat touching, it really um, increases the lifetime of that writing staying as writing and not becoming you guessing which button is which. Uh, it's reportable main because it has a use. It, it's, a, it's a protective coating. Um, it's low risk for PFOA because it's so low co concentration. Any potential residual unintentional PFOA is below measurable levels, um, but it, there's no derogation for it in PFAS. This all goes away unless people submit it. And it's a very light coating. And there's a really good reason it's there. What the coating is is a bit interesting time because it's not PTFE powder because you can't put PTFE powder on your infuse it. So if you look at your, your, your food pan, that's PTFE powder that's been heated up and fused to metal. You're not heating up this silicone at 600 degrees. You won't have silicone anymore you'll have a scorch mark. Um, so uh, there are more interesting polymers that are being added, usually emulsions that are added, floral emulsions that are added. Um, often a PTFE emulsion of some sort, but usually a more complicated, interesting chemical, which at this point in time, it's so low concentration, you can only measure the fact that it's fluorine and on a silicone, um, but pretty common. Interesting, some people have been, you know, worried for a long time about, you know, the Teflon uh, pans or dishes and such because of the dangers. And um, following it, there, there were a lot of anecdotal stories and they seemed a bit crazy for the longest time where so-and-so would say, hey, I had a new frying pan and my budgie died. And I had a new frying pan and my parakeet died. And, and I had a new, you know, this kind of um, uh, PTFE coated light and my canary died. And then one day, she was like, I got new PTFE lamps, my roaster chickens, and they all died. Okay, now, literally cooking with gas. And it looks at like what happens is when PTFE is heated up by the time where, point where it burns, two things happen. Um, if you get to like mm, 600 plus degrees Celsius or higher past even the curing temperature, it'll eventually burn to plastic and it releases carbon monoxide and hydrochloric acid. But the carbon monoxide will kill low flying avians, the canary in the mine shaft. So um, really interesting. Yes, if you heat your frying pan up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit, bad things will happen. But if you're up to 900 degrees Fahrenheit in your house, bad things are happening. Um, at that point in time, that might not be your biggest problem. Um, so very nerd. Um, lots of other uses. Uh, we don't get as much test as lithium batteries. It's it, most lithium ion batteries, the cathode, even a lot of the button cells use it. It's the binder in the PVDF is the binder in the cathode of lithium ion. Uh, you can't have electric cars without PVDF in them. Um, but we don't test it very often because if you've ever nicked with a screwdriver lithium battery, the anode and cathode are both wrapped on the surface and they short. And then you get a lot, it's not fire usually, you get spraying hot liquid, and a lot of hissing. It's not, it's definitely counterindicated. So we do testing, we have old comments like, we're not taking the battery apart because it's it's spectacular what happens. It's not like you can slowly peel it. Um, the one people that are really good at taking lithium batteries apart are uh, meth. Um, uh, people manufacture meth, which, you know, variety of chemistry things. I know. Um, so what you do is you, you take lithium cylinder batteries and you take uh, pipe cutters. Uh, you a pipe cutter and you quickly cut each side and you do it really quick. Don't do it slow because um, you need to cut it and pour the you know, 
with a pipe cutter and pour the lithium out because they want the lithium. They need the lithium. They need your miracle Grow fertilizer and they need your um, Sudafed, Sudafedrine to make mats. It's, it's really straightforward. And then you see the one pop model, you just get a two liter Coke bottle and a hose and, and you're off to the races. Um, but the way you get the lithium battery, and they're really good at it, because if you need a lot of uh, uh, lithium for the reaction to make meth, is you take a pipe cutter to a, a large like AAA type battery, and you go really quick, and then pour out the lithium. So any sparking won't be a problem between the cathode and anode if you pour the lithium out. For most wrap batteries, the mine batteries, you can't do that. And we're not really like, you know, the, the meth dealers and meth addicts are not great at process instructions. So we don't dismantle lithium batteries. Um, Yes, yeah, like hiring a meth addict for their knowledge. That would be spectacular. Uh, okay, so PTFE lubricants. So PTFE is often used in lubricants as a powder. It's suspended in the mineral oil or silicon oil, and, it, and it, it affects the friction or viscosity, obviously, about the lubricant. So we see that. So in one of our graphs, you'll see gel. That's often when the, when the, the tester sees it's actually a lubricant, and they just mark it as gel. Um, those gel positives are actually uh, floral lubricants. Um, waterproof stickers to make a sticker, polyester or, or paper really waterproof, especially polyester too, is to fluorocoat it. So we see waterproof stickers on the outside of products. Uh, Kynar piping and water, PVDF, especially those piping that you get in your house to heat the floor. Um, that's Kynar, PVDF. Uh, PTFE tape when you're attaching two tubes together or whatever for fluids, pools or other conduits, um, that white tape is PTFE tape. It's kind of neat actually. It's literally solid PTFE. So the way you make a solid PTFE part, like you're making this one, is you, as I mentioned earlier, you put the powder in a mold, heat it up to 400 degrees Celsius, and it fuses into solid piece. So what you do with tape is you make a huge cylinder mold, pour the powder in, heat it up, fuse it into a solid cylinder, flip it on its side, and then you skive it. It's kind of a fancy word for peel it. You put a blade against it, and you turn the cylinder, and it peels off a strip, very controlled, like you're shaving it, uh, very controlled blade, and then you apply adhesive and you rewrap it on another spool. And then you segregate it and that's, that's PTFE tape. Um, and so PTFE tape is actually solid PTFE, very thinly peeled off a, a solid piece. Um, waterproof uh, fabric, and especially ones that have to be chemical resistant. Um, there will be derogations for waterproof fabric for, for chemical resistant situations for sure. If you're sitting there and you need the stuff to protect you in a, in a firefighting situation, you want the good stuff. You don't want to like, well, most he did, except for that part went through. Um, no, you don't want that. And then uh, food packaging coating. Um, a lot of people move to paper. Uh, paper is wrought awful at its job. It's it's porous, it's fiber. The only, the only time when you get paid, hey, look, this paper food packaging works great. Paper works great because it's floral coated. So we had a lunch and learn last week, which we do once a month. And we, we usually get everybody together. And some people here teach some complicated topic, conflict minerals or, or, or uh, uh, PFAS is one of them, and we had um, we had taco salads in and taco bowls, and the bowls of taco salads came in were wonderful and amazing and survived all the taco ingredients. They're fluoro coating, which is by the way perfectly harmless. There's not enough of anything dangerous in there to be a problem. It's and fluorine is just unreactive. That's the whole point. It's not reacting with anything. That's why it's so such a good coating. It's being banned in a lot of jurisdictions, which is horror, which is unfortunate because it's the thing that makes the paper work. It's the safe thing that makes the paper work, as opposed to just falling apart. Um, if you ever get like, you know, some unknown place where you get a Frappuccino and you get their paper straws, they're completely useless now. They can't, especially when you get like a one of the little chocolate chips in it. It's not going up that paper straw. That paper straw is mush. It is becoming part of the drink. And then there's two really specific ones that are kind of unique because they actually have exemptions, derogations for the long chain PFAC because they can't be made without it. And it's not they're used to make it. These are both ones that have a um, side chain group attached with an ester and oxygen that the fluoro oxy container, so PFA, which is a very flexible form of chemical resistant form of PTFE, um, has a, a, a PFAS group that breaks off and in oxygen forms carboxylates. So when we ever test the PFOA, we get every single carboxylate all the way up and down the chain because it's a random piece that breaks off. And it's normal, it's, it's not added to it, it's literally just a very couple hundred part per billion trace um, degradation product. Uh, irradiated PDF, PVDF or F PTFE heat shrink. Um, normally, um, PTFE is this, or PVDF is this long chain, I said repeating chain. It's solid. To make it into rubber, you have to cross link it. So you have to break the chain randomly, which they use gamma radiation. They irradiate it, breaks the chain in little pieces. And then chains reattach together, they cross link, and that forms rubber. Rubber is cross linked. 
And when you break all the pieces apart in oxygen, some of them react, react with oxygen and become a carboxylate. So they always have a small amount of all the PFOA family. It's allowed. It's only allowed because somebody asked for it. And they asked for it in a radiated PTFE because that's the people who asked for it. They're, they radiated PTFE. Well, the fellows that have radiated PVDF never got around to asking and they're up Poop Creek without a paddle right now. Um, so, and there's a way to manage that problem. So don't assume that other people are gonna submit your derogations that work for you because in the past, it never happens. Medical devices aren't so bad about it. Everybody else is rotten at it. Uh, so again, we do tons of testing. Um, definitely screening side, it's fantastic. Um, you know, no fluoro, no PFAS. Second part, if you're worried about PFOA, it's only in the PFASs. So you find the PFASs first, then we can check for the PFOA family using LC mass spec. Um, how we do for a lot of companies is representative product testing. Like you say, hey, I have thousands of products. Mm -hmm. You're just reporting. So this is not perfection, but you need to complete. And you definitely for Europe want to know all the reasons you use it. So you don't get caught with your pants down having to redesign everything in the next couple of years. Um, we, we pick representative products and we test those. And we're just screening. So it's not this convoluted process. Making these machines and tests for PFAS is very difficult initially. Well, it's got it validated. It's a straightforward assembly line here. Um, and we can tell you, you know, these are the parts with uh, intentionally at PFAS, and this is what they are, and this is why you have it. Um, it gives you everything you need for main reporting, for the EU PFAS restriction consultation, for the US federal TOSCA reporting next year, and the Canadian reporting later this year. It's really simple. It's, it's the best risk based approach. Like you're gonna get the most bang for your buck. You make tons of products. We're just gonna test a couple. It's an assembly line factory here. It's not knitting. That's why you get a tremendous amount of value for your dollar. Um, you're not doing something like, hey, you're the only person doing it. No, 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 literally thousands. Um, so it works great. So as I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions, submit it in the control panel and I'll try to get to as many as possible. I am almost over time. I'll try to get to everybody as I try to bring up the questions. By the way, everybody who registers, uh, uh, oh, great question. UL requires no drip for flame retardancy in, in VL, UL94, V0, and, and V1 uh, PC ABS plastics. The PFAS rules are in a cone focus safety. What can we do? That's exactly why you submit it in the, this is a really good point, by the way. Yeah, I need it for fire safety. Absolutely. Is the replacement? Not a very good one, and I don't want my products to burn, and I don't want to have a good replacement next year. So that's why you want to make sure that it's submitted, and it covers not just ABS, it causes public polycarbonate, and why. And you need it for this standard. And until this, unless we find a good replacement where the standard could be updated for it, we can't do this. And so that's the whole point with the EU consultation, is you want to make sure that you're, that is all submitted, which you have to know you're using it and in what materials. Yes, it, it's absolutely important. There's a lot of good reasons why PTFE exists. It's not, it's generally a little more expensive than every other material. So if it's used, it's a darn good reason why it's being used. As I said before, if you have like some kind of endoscope going up an artery in your body, you don't want it reacting with things and you definitely don't want it sticking to stuff as it goes through. Of the global PFAS regulations, which are applicable to medical devices? Uh, all but AB 1200. AB 1200 is food, contact packaging. Um, but there'll be, and, and the federal task. So anything that's uh, EPA related is not FDA related. So the, the reporting in Maine will be is, the Canadian survey will be, the EU restriction will be, however, there are some derogations for very specific medical situations like implantable, uh, but they're very carved out. Um, the PFOA and long chain PFAC restrictions in Europe do apply under region pop, but they have later deadlines for medical. Uh, 2023 or 2025, depending on what it is. And Prop 65, the warning does apply if you're a PFOA type exposure. So the, the floral polymers, you're looking, you're looking at uh, reporting in Maine, Canada, um, fed, not federal in the US because Tosca. There will be a reporting requirement around the 2026 for Europe, as it'll weighs out, uh, three or four years. Uh, that was the main one. And the PFOA, of course, the restrictions in Europe, just the later time frame and, and Prop 65. It sounds like PFA restrictions then should be like ROHS exemptions. Is that a correct assumption? Yes, they'll have derogations. Now, actually it's funny, kind of a little strange. The ROHS exemptions are gonna become like the PFAS derogations, or like the REACH derogations. And you're like, what? So you might've noticed if you're following REACH that there's these exemptions that are some renewal process that has kind of disappeared off into the sunset. Nobody knows what's going on. 
That's because it's uh, RHS is directive and run by the commission, which really doesn't have an organized body to do this kind of thing. Regulations like REACH and POP have the European Chemical Agency, and that's why their restrictions keep moving forward, for better or for worse. They have a process and an infrastructure and entity. When ROS is redesigned into a regulation, it's gonna be done really explicitly to move all this functional stuff into ECHA. And at that point in time, it'll be moved from exemptions, the old fashioned, more into the style of derogations controlled by the European Chemical Agency. So it's kind of funny in the ways RHS, we move more into this system and both systems become more mature. Because right now the exemption system doesn't exactly work for RHS. It's being moved into the same system as region pop. It'll be part of the new ROS regulation when they get around to it. Will mold release be an issue in the EU with hard plastic like ABS? Yes and no. Is it used to release ABS? It can be, not as much as polycarbonate. However, ABS is really non-porous. And so if it was used, nobody will know because not enough it sticks around. So when we test ABS, we don't really see the mold release. If we do, we can't tell the difference much between it and the, uh, the anti-drip. How confident are you that the LCMS equipment you're using doesn't contribute to PFAS contamination versus sampled path through PFAS containing services in the fluid path? Fantastic question. That's why we have control. That's why you have negative and positive controls. And we've done lots of repeatability. We do so much repeatability. We don't, and we do tons of interlap. Um, it's so funny. A lot of people who test with us look at all the certifications in ISO, and we have all the ISO certs and, and all that paperwork. Realistically, when we're working with ourselves, other people, we don't, we, it's always interlab testing. So let's let a couple people try it out and see if we get the same results. By the way, every RLHS standard, if you scroll to the very bottom of the standard, which most people don't do because you have lives, um, you'll see the interlab stuff. And it's spectacular. Like, how did this get approved? I mean, yeah, a lot of the RLHS standards, for example, need improvements because they didn't really, they did interlab, but kind of. And you can see in the interlab what was going wrong. Um, so definitely we do, you know, negative and positive control stuff that doesn't doesn't happen. That's very detectable um, what it is. And we do tons of interlab, like, okay, we're saying this, what is the other guy's machine is in case we're doing something or somebody else is doing something that is in the process or somewhere else the, that it's affecting the measurements. Contamination of the measurements is, is it not a risk and a risk depending on how you see it. Um, definitely because of the, the controls, the daily and the checks and the calibrations and stuff like that, um, we're able to see all that kind of stuff. But that's a really good question. For example, the biggest PFAS contamination that we've seen, and we have lots of controls to pick this up, is one of the uses of PFAS, which I didn't go into here, in the metals, there's two metals used. So it's used in water filters, those like mesh filters, they often have a PFAS coating. Um, the other main one, uh, they're showing my cut there in my hand. We have an ice storm here, or it's actually the ice is, it, my car is, is actually embedded in an ice block right now. It's uh, kind of annoying. Um, the uh, cutting guide, so a saw or we like a hole cutter, they're often the, the cutter or the blade is floral coated. It makes it, you know, if you ever saw, you saw you've done a lot of sawing and your blade starts getting stuck, that's really annoying. Um, floral coated, it doesn't do that. It fires right through. Um, so they're floral coated, which means if we use it to cut something, so we have to be very careful with our tools, you can leave a tiny bit of floral residue because that fluorine in the cutting process can be left behind. So contamination is a real thing. Um, definitely we have tons and tons and tons and tons of controls for it. Uh, main requires reporting weight of PFAS specific cast number and a recognized analytic method. Are you able to report the weight specific cast number? Uh, yes. And is FTR a recognized method? Uh, the, the recognized method is the fluorine concentration. So the WDX or F to do 50 ppm, no problem. So the, the recognized method is the detection limit. So that's easy. That's the WD. The FTR and the engineering helps us with the cast number. So when we do the main reporting for you, we tell you up front, you know, it's this substance. And, and, and this is the concentration. Now it's funny, the weights in the most recent one changed to concentrations from weights. So instead of grams, it's percent. Uh, we can do either, literally if it's 50%, we know the part, but it's normally actually concentrations now. The last one we, the last draft they submitted. It could change again. Um, yes, we do that. It's not a problem. Um, so there's a cast number, when it's a polymer. This is the polymer one. This is what would be on the SDS. Are the SDS vague about fluoropolymers? Absolutely. Um, but it's as good or better than you can see from anyone else. So, um, floral polymers are some. So, everybody's floral polymer might have similar cast numbers, but they're not the same thing. Um, it's all a very interesting problem. So, the detection method, the recognized method, the WDX RF is really good for 50 ppm. It does a fantastic job, particularly for coatings, which combustion bomb has trouble with coatings. And then the cast number is, you wouldn't get that from a recognized test method for 
that. PFOA you would, pour on polymers, no. Polymers are, the test method is fluorine. PFOA, the test method is 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 by CAS. Um, it's LCMS. It's a really good question. So it's funny, it's two different test methods, polymers or fluorine, and you can see that in the European one, and uh, the water solubles are uh, chromatography for mass spec. Doing chromatography mass spec for polymers is pretty pointless. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for all the questions. Everybody register, receive a copy of the slides. If you need help, and with time frames, I'm pretty sure everybody does, please contact us. Believe it or not, this is faster, easier, generally less expensive, but definitely faster and easier to get a great answer and move forward. We do tons of this. Um, you do it on your own. You're going to have all the stumbles of doing it on your own. Um, just have to do it for you or with you are really good at this. So everybody, pleasure talking to you. We should be sending out slides pretty soon. There should be a recording available by the end of the week and I look forward to talking to everyone again soon.